January. I'm calling our January meeting to order. Uh, thank you all for having allowed us to shift the date to this particular night. Um, let's rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Like the to the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Irene, let me first turn it to you and to Todd for the financial report. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone in the audience here. Uh, so we're halfway through the fiscal year and at a high level, we've received about 46% of the budgeted revenue and spent about 42% of budgeted expenditures. Um, thus far, there hasn't been any capital expenditures. Uh, with respect to operating expenditures, we haven't spent as much in terms of street surface resurfacing or snow removal. Um, Nothing has been set aside yet for, or should say spent yet for Rainscape supplemental funding or um, legal counsel as much in relation to Corso and the farm women's market uh, projects. But winter is done, not done yet. And the uh, projects, farm women's market and Corso is not done yet. So uh, just letting you know that in terms of monthly budgeting, um, just where things are at. But overall we're on track and in the coming weeks, I'm going to be working with, with Todd, our town manager, to start putting together materials for next year's budget. Uh, actually, that's already begun um, by, by Todd. So that's my report. Todd, do you have anything you wish to add? I don't, thanks. Any questions for my colleagues? All right. I, just have, I just have one I'd like to ask, which is um, <clears throat> on the WIN payments. Um, I guess we, I saw like 9,500 or so has been spent. Our total for the year is like 35, 36,000. Is that what we pay each year? Is that right? Something in that bracket? That's right. Uh, how come we've only paid one so far? Uh, because the other year. three are due February, May, and June. Ah, it's not done. Oh, right. It's done as in accordance with when, by, by, as a deduct from what we otherwise receive in our quarterly estimation. We don't pay Correct. on a quarterly basis. Correct. Got it. Okay. Never mind. One, one quick question, if I can add. Um, just um, can you give us an update on what our reserves are currently? And then uh, does that include, and also adding on the ARPA money? I don't know if I can do it off the top of my head, but uh, our right. audited uh, fund balance was, oh boy. I, can I give those figures to you tomorrow? ARPA's 2.4. ARPA's 2.4. And are we still hovering at 12? Okay. We're around, around 12. Okay. And ARPA would add another two. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, good. Thank you. Stable. Uh, town manager's report. I think your mic's off. Town manager's report, please. Uh, thanks. I'll, I'll review some of the uh, initiatives undertaken by staff over the last month. Uh, and in addition to assisting with several of the major projects, including Corso Chevy Chase rezoning redevelopment and Farm Women's Market Parks Development Project, uh, both of which we, we discussed tonight. Staff also continued to uh, manage Zimmerman Park Redevelopment Project and Cochrane Run Stabilization Project. Um, Dave will brief the council on both of those um, initiatives uh, later this evening. Staff also communicated with Montgomery County Department of Transportation regarding um, a requested and agreed upon storm drain inlet installation at um for at Oak Ridge and Thornapple and at Maple and Thornapple as part of an effort to improve drainage in that location. We've also followed up with them about their continued storm drain maintenance based on the survey that we have performed with an independent contractor to identify uh, needed maintenance for our storm drain inlets in town. Uh, they began that effort, Montgomery County Department of Transportation began that effort prior to the holidays and said they would pick it up again after the holidays. So we followed up with them to figure out when, in fact, they're going to uh, restart uh, that effort. Haven't heard anything yet, but I'll let you know when we do. 
uh, staff oversaw the completion of the mm -hmm. townwide leaf collection service. And we completed the FY24 state aid for police protection grant application with the state. We also continue to address parking concerns and traffic issues around oneness school. Um, staff assisted the public services committee with addressing issues uh, related to the proposed slowdown and stop campaign, which will be discussed tonight. We also provided some feedback to the climate and environment committee regarding the Rosemary Garden proposal, which will also be discussed this evening. Um, other highlights is that we've continued to redesign um, to manage the redesign of the website. Unfortunately, it's taking much longer than we anticipated, given some restructuring that's occurring at the um, some turmoil potentially that's occurring at the uh, at our web host and developer. And um, but we're making pretty good progress and we hope to have something to present to the council, hopefully uh, next month, potentially. Right. Right. Um, other than that, just an update on um, deployments of LED stop signs and radar speed boards. Uh, we, as the council knows, have three LED stop signs already deployed in the field, and we two new ones are arriving on Monday. Uh, we're going to deploy those at some of the locations where we have, we, we've identified um, that are uh, worthy of, 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 of those signs specifically westbound Stanford at East and eastbound Leland uh, uh, at at East. Um, for the radar speed boards, we have four in hand. One, as you know, is on northbound East. Uh, one is going to be deployed on a trailer. It will be a mobile uh, radar speed board. Initially, it will be deployed on West Avenue facing northbound um, before Stanford. And we have two others that are reserved, and we ordered those in anticipation of allowing residents to request the deployment of those based on the revised policy that the council approved. We've also cleaned up um, some of the do not enter signage at Stanford and West and added uh, wrong way signs. We did that last week. And as you've seen, we've also undertaken some significant office improvements. Um, phase two will be uh, more of a um, effort to determine how to um, reconfigure the office space and put in new carpeting and new lights. Um, so that's forthcoming as well. And that concludes the staff report. Hey, thank you. Uh, first, I'm very pleased with the new acoustical panels that are here in the town hall. I think they make a difference. They do. Also, they make a uh, huge difference. Since, since you, Todd, by every right, enjoyed a full month vacation, congratulations to you. I'm glad you did it. <laughs> but also the town staff performed very, very well. And Dave, uh, thank you very much for your effort. John Lloyd, uh, Miguel, uh, Trevor, everybody really took care of things and I think uh, handled it very well. So it's, it's comforting to know the town manager can take a vacation and things don't fall apart. That's a, that's a good sign. <laughs> that's good, That's good. very good. I, uh, they, all, they all did a great job and they're very great. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Time now for public comments. Are there any residents who would wish to address the council at this time? Sure. You need to go there and speak to the microphone. So please give your name and address and the mic is yours. Well, first, a happy new year to all. Uh, my name's Adam Arkell. I live at... Um, Could you speak up a little bit? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name's Adam Arkell. I live on uh, Meadow Lane, 7015 Meadow Lane. Uh, I, I came here tonight. I wanted to come and express appreciation to the town council for the very effective letter last month that was sent to Corso. Um, I thought it was a great letter, as so I wanted to express uh, appreciation for that. I, I saw the uh, response from Corso that was posted uh, yesterday or the day before. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly very pleased. I wanted to come and say uh, uh, this uh, it looks like tremendous progress has been obtained from Corso, particularly with respect to the building height issue. And I, I wanted to come and uh, express appreciation for these efforts. Thank you very much. You can come back and say that as often as you wish. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Are there any other comments? Going once, twice. I don't see anybody else on the screen. Okay. <clears throat> so with that, we will turn to council discussions. We have no variances. Um, and uh, 
<clears throat> I'll start with just a couple of minutes as I'm the liaison to the committee and have done, done a lot with Corso. Uh, the, um, uh, we have just received the, finally the response from the developers uh, that was posted just uh, yesterday. Uh, they had initially said that they were, the, the initial date for the resubmission was December 23rd. When they did not meet that date, we actually took it to be a good sign because it was for them to really do the work to take seriously our comments, they would obviously need more time than they could possibly have uh, been able, had to, to do that work by the 23rd. Uh, I think uh, we all feel what was really very important was that we, we were able to garner the support of the planning staff. Um, and so when they planning staff put in their comments uh, uh, back on December 17th, um, in respect to the first resubmission, uh, and we had filed our letter that Adam, you just referred to, the planning staff just said very simply, we support the position of the town of Chevy Chase in regard to heights. That single sentence was incredibly important. Uh, and I think that's what really got the attention of the developers to realize that the town and the planning staff were aligned on this issue and they had to take it seriously. So uh, we are very pleased that, that was, they did take it seriously and did a lot of work. Uh, but also we're pleased with that alignment with the planning staff. So that was all good. Um, last night, there was a meeting of the special committee. I was not able to make it, but Rich and Irene were. Is there anything you wish to report on the conversations? Um, yeah, Irene, jump in whenever, yeah. whenever you want. <clears throat> um, the committee was generally pleased with the resubmission um, of, the, uh, of the rezoning application. And um, they supported the revised heights and massing as depicted in those new submissions. Um, there were a couple of other minor things that they um, would like to see uh, still. We, we didn't see any cell tower images. And so we, we need to get that from the developer. And um, after the developer has some time to look at the reconfigurations of, because of that, um, those lowering of those heights on the on the perimeter uh they'd like to see an updated gross square footage and unit count in, in there as well and they were also <clears throat> they had also asked to to the uh, developer to show the phase what the phase one and phase two um, build outs would look, look like and uh, the phase one is all all of the back buildings and the gate, and then the front buildings would be the phase two. They were gonna leave that uh, open. Um, and so they had some questions about that and, and some uh, suggestions about leaving the trees while the, the phase, <laughs> phase one is, uh, is, is after the phase one is completed. But in general, they were very, uh, very supportive of the, uh, of the rezoning, of the resubmission for the rezoning. Okay, good, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, on the northwest corner, um, the, which is the the a um, part of the project that's the closest to a particular resident, um, the recommendation from the committee was to keep it to what was originally proposed, um, given that it isn't the, the their their January, if you will, submission wasn't as compatible. Um, but overall, they they I, exactly as Rich was saying, they felt that this um new projection and 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 uh, height is a lot more compatible uh, with the neighborhood and they were um also very pleased with the fact that that the uh, there will be a you know kind of a new traffic or vehicle study um mm -hmm. and and uh the parking study as well. Um, right. So, so overall, felt that there was tremendous progress. Totally concur that um, because the planning department was so uh, aligned with what the the town um, wanted to see, that things seemed to shuffle into place. There's no updated timeline as of yet for when um, comments will need to be you know, submitted by the town or anyone else on this, nor when the hearing examiner will look at the, or, or hear, you know, what it is that's the, but I suspect, we kind of suspect it might fall into March or, or, or April, depending on availability, so. Todd, have you heard anything further about resetting the date? Originally it was the, the, the 
planning board public hearing, I think was supposed to be something like February 9th, but that was only if the resubmission had been made on December 23rd. We don't know whether the slippage is day for day or something more or less, right? We just don't know at the moment. That's correct. Yeah, Grace has not. Um, she actually sent me an email this morning indicating that the new documents, the re rezoning, the final application documents were on the DAIC, but she indicated that she did not yet have a, a new schedule for consideration for the planning, either the planning board hearing or the hearing examiner hearing. Okay, good, thank you. I do, I, I'm sure, I do want to make a clarification on that Northwest corner. They, um, they didn't have, uh, they had no objection to leaving the Northwest corner the way it was they they did not want they they however did not want to say they preferred one or the other they said let okay the, let the contractor worry okay. about that all right let's do it um i guess what i would i'd like to propose i think we need to this is all very helpful and i'm very grateful the committee met so quickly and i think todd thank you for getting the town criers out so quickly as well uh we'd only received that information friday night got it out on Tuesday, which is essentially the next business, the next working day. Um, and also, I hope uh, residents will take note that we've provided a lot of distinct links to individual, pre individual pieces of their application so that people can be guided to what we believe to be the most relevant and, and what they would want to see, uh, which doesn't mean they shouldn't look at everything, but at least could look at some of the most important documents. Um, I'd like to suggest that we proceed uh, in a measured way in terms of our preparing the groundwork for our, the public hearing. And I, I think the first step of that, which I've had a chance to discuss maybe uh, individually, is to have, um, I, I, not tonight, because after all, residents have only seen the drawings at most for the last day and a half, but to schedule a town forum, um, which I would suggest we try to do by the end of this month, um, to permit residents more time to review things and give us their comments and that we uh, defer our own deliberations until after we've had that chance to hear from residents, if that's something that makes sense to people. Um, and um, I'm just to put out a date, because I forgot it, because I was wondering whether Monday evening, uh, the 30th, I think it's the 30th. It's a Monday, yes. Uh, so might be a date that would be workable mm -hmm. for people. And it seems to me we could probably just do it by Zoom, um, um, uh, if, if that's all right, and just allow residents that opportunity. Are, are you thinking, I think it's a great idea, are you thinking uh, presentation by Corso, just no, total no, internal No, no, I, I don't committee. think we need, I think Corso's presentation They're is out, complete. I mean, for this one. Uh, yeah. But I think this would be the chance for us to hear from residents who've now had the opportunity to review the package more completely and to raise with us any issues or thoughts they have before we go into our deliberations. <clears throat> Um, so, so Mayor, I will not be in town, um, but I, uh, if we do it via By virtual, Zoom. then I'll, I'll figure something out. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank Visiting you. family, so I'll figure sure. something no, out. Right. Yeah. Good to uh, take a break from that family to join this family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is that all right with folks? Yes. We try to do that. Great. Yes. So that that I think is plenty of time. So we ought to get a town crier out. Um, uh, Todd tomorrow to to announce that that's what we're going to do. Um, and then I think hopefully over the next several days, we'll find out just when the uh, public hearing will be held. And then that we, once we have that, that should guide us as to when we as a town council will need to uh, pull together our thoughts. Um, uh, one point which uh, Joy raised with me earlier today is that the February town council meeting is February 8th. So that would be literally just, well, nine days after the public forum we're talking about. So if we're not under undue pressure to get comments back to the, to the planning staff, that might be a sensible time for us to have our own deliberations. Um, if we do need to work faster than that, we may have to see if there's some way we can have a work session or something, but I think we can decide that once we know more about the schedule. Yes. But this would be good to let the residents know when we'd like to hear from them. Yeah. And obviously, what any 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 forum is not uh, preclude people sending in their own comments in writing, which we're always happy to have. Just a clarification: yeah. our we're we're shooting for a submission or a letter to the planning staff. That's not the hearing. We need to have our comments 
You're, you're correct. The there, are two, there are two. There are two. Mm -hmm. There are two right. different things. Right. One would be any comments we wish to register with the planning staff in time for them to incorporate in their final report to the planning right. board. Right. Separately would be testimony we would give directly to the planning board. Right. Uh, right. We can do both. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anything else on Corso? All right. Um, turning next to the Farm Women's Market Project, um, the um, <clears throat> um, Irene and I, every other week, we have a phone call among the four partners for this project. Uh, the partners being the town, the county, basically the Department of Transportation that owns the parking lots, uh, the Parks Department, uh, which for everyone's understanding, the Parks Department is not a county agency. Uh, it reports to the, I always get the acronym wrong, the National, the Maryland Ca National, National Capital, Capital, Capital Planning Planning Planning. thank you, the Maryland National <laughs> Capital Park and Planning Commission, thank you. Um, uh, and and uh, the uh, and then the fourth partner, of course, are the developers, EYA and Bernstein Management Corporation. Um, and at the discussion that we had uh, a week ago, Wednesday, uh, this past Wednesday, the uh, the developers uh, made a couple of statements. First of all, they're now looking much more uh, carefully at all the aspects of the project and what has to be done. There's a general feeling that. The very first thing that would be great to be able to undertake is undergrounding of the utilities, which is very important in many places in order for them to be able to actually build the project, but also is a portion of the project that does not have to go through site plan and a lot of permitting. Uh, it can sort of have its own, own trajectory. Um, they also believe that costs have gone up and that the uh, undergrounding is more expensive than they had put in the budget. Uh, and there's general inflation. That's one reason. Second reason is the um, uh, that the they've heard now from Pepco that Pepco will want to do the work themselves. Uh, they will want to plan it. They want to build, do the undergrounding. So there will not be the opportunity for competitive bidding, uh, which might otherwise have been the case. And thirdly, Pepco standards are 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 stricter or higher, perhaps, than what the developers had anticipated in respect to the integration of the wires that are undergrounded to the wires that then go back up you know, above, above the street. So cost overruns. Um, <clears throat> they have <clears throat> would like to pursue some, some help from the state. I don't think we have any problem in asking the state for help. But um, I guess what I wanted to discuss with, with, uh, with all of you is that um, I think we have to be very mindful about uh, the costs, and we have to be mindful about the priorities as we in the town see them. I think uh, in our past discussions, we've always been very clear about how important the parks are and the amenities in those parks, and we want to make sure that there's funding for that. Uh, we know that a fair amount of the undergrounding is, is necessary for the construction, but on the other hand, and some of you have raised this in past council meetings, not necessarily all of it. <laughs> Some of it is kind of a nice to have for aesthetic reasons, but not necessarily essential. Uh, and so um, one, one thought which um, I brought up with the developers is do we really need to underground the wires along 46th Street? Mm -hmm. Those are five poles. They sit between the curb and the sidewalk. So they're not infringing on the park. Could they stay? Would that be a way to potentially manage the cost of this a little bit better? So what I wanted to ask if, if there's support that we can go back to the developers and ask them to submit some different packages uh, for the undergrounding of the utilities. One which would, could still include the scope as they had envisioned it, but another would include a scope that would delete uh, that section on 46th Street so that we can understand what could be the cost savings arising from that change. So I'm not asking that we support it. I'm just asking that we collectively want that information so we can make an informed decision down the road um, as to whether we would believe it should, should, should still be done or whether we would agree that it would be, it would be a sensible and prudent action to, to delete that. Um, <clears throat> so that is, that's one issue that I wanted to raise. The other one um, also having to do with undergrounding utilities is the, uh, and Irene, you've been very involved in this in discussions uh, from the Public Services Committee's perspective, which is that, that um, um, there are, I guess, three poles along 
the, the east side of 47th Street in Elm Street Park. And, and uh, it, in the, when all of us who looked at the design for the surface Capitol Crescent Trail, which has to, we all know half of it's been completed, but there's still more that has to be built and a portion that has to run along Elm Street Park, that there'd be more flexibility and potentially more, a better way to design that, tr that surface trail if those poles were eliminated and the wires were put underground. Uh, so again, without our taking a position, could we also ask the developers to give us a, a estimate for what it would cost to add that undergrounding to the package of undergrounding, which would be done anyway in respect to the parks project, uh, so that we can know what that delta is and then potentially consider how that could be added. So those are really the two things that I wanted to ask if that would be acceptable to everyone to go forward with this. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if I could just add, I mean, I, I really appreciate the way you're framing this, and, and I, I think that's the right way for us to engage at this stage is to, you know, the goal of this at the end of the day is, is a high quality park on those lot areas and, and something that, that we know will benefit the community, Bethesda, et cetera. So yeah, safeguarding that, if that means undergrounding is what falls by the wayside, um, then that's what, that's what has to happen. So yeah, I, 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 I concur with where, where you're going on that. Um, I don't want us to just be underwriting utility undergrounding and, and that be the end of it. And then we don't end up having enough resources for a nice uh, surface park. Right. Yeah, I, I, I completely uh, like, I like the idea of separating the utility discussion from the park discussion. This uh, what residents have been um, thinking about in terms of what our contribution would be towards this project, you know, park mm -hmm. amenities, if you will. Um, I do have a question, though, about when we would really get this information from about the Delta, right? Because my understanding from the last conversation, please let me know if I, if, if I um, misunderstood, was that there would be the hiring of a dry um, utility consultant that would give some sort of a, I don't want to say back of envelope, but just an approximate cost um, associated with what could be going on along 46th Street. And then as you make your way down to Willow towards Wisconsin. Um, but yet Pepco still needs to, you know, fill in the rest of the blanks. And Pepco is not necessarily responsive when it comes to um, providing estimates that one can count on. So if, if we were I agree with the approach, but if we were to uh, agree to this, what's the timing of actually finding out this information that would be aligned with all the other moving parts associated with this, you know, discussion? It, it's it's a good question. I I can't answer that. It's going to take some time. Uh, one of the we're in discussion. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Well, I'll try to speak closer. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Beth. We'll try to speak louder. Um, the, um, there are some additional steps that have to be taken before they can actually uh, go to PEPCO with what is really needed. They have to know how much electricity is required by these buildings uh, and also how much they want to have, for example, with uh, um, uh, charging stations for EVs and things like this. So they have to do some work themselves and that's gonna take a couple of months. So they're still a little bit away before they can even present to Pepco what they would want Pepco to be able to, to do. But I, I think we just have to lodge our request and say, and, and, and essentially put our partners on notice that we wanna have some flexibility here in terms of thinking about how much undergrounding is really needed and we are not on automatic pilot that automatically everything is done that was in the initial scope a long mm -hmm. time ago. Mm -hmm. And we're not on automatic pilot to contribute. The right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, other, the other thing on, on Corso is we're also pushing uh, where we can to uh, on, on two agreements that the town is very much involved with. One is a funding agreement with the county in respect to the money that the county would get from us to help pay for the garage and associated undergrounding. And then the much larger component is, is associated with a contract that we would have a contract uh, agreement we will have with the parks department for the money that we would be using to support the parks. Uh, 
uh, and uh, an associate undergrounding there. So uh, those are two different funding agreements. Uh, we have received a first draft initially from the county, which we found unacceptable. We pushed back, rewrote it. They came back having accepted most of our changes, but still two things we objected to. We've now gone back to them again, uh, and we're waiting for a further response. Uh, we were the initial drafters of the agreement going to the uh, Parks Department, and I shared that with everybody just before the holidays. Uh, the lawyer for the commission uh, has been on vacation and is only back this week. Uh, and Todd, I think you heard, I guess we, we, we don't know yet, have a date for when we're going to hear back from the Parks Department, but we hope sometime next week. Is that right? Is that what Mitty said? Todd's not, I don't see him. I guess he had to leave. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's, I don't have that anything for that, 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 that's, that's correct. That's okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, those two agreements we're working on, but our partners have to come back to us with comments. Uh, we'll have another discussion this coming Wednesday. Um, uh, and um, I think that's about it for the parks. Uh, turning to uh, Zimmerman Park. Sorry, I just oh, sorry. had one one thing sure. that just occurred to me. So we, the town entered into an agreement with the county, a, a memorandum of understanding with the county with respect to the Capitol Crescent Surface Trail. And the way the agreement was um, uh, put together, it, it left open the, the tunnel question. And I'm wondering, given today's uh, uh, magazine, I'm sorry, newspaper, whatever article about the, the increase in costs as it relates to the construction of the tunnel, is it worth going back to the county to see, you know, is there, is there, some, this is along the lines of this utility discussion, is there something that can be done since we're still like in the design, final design phase so that we can inch you're, we're inching on this side about the uh, burying the utilities. Can we also can we also work on the other end, on the county <laughs> side, to to help them see the light about this? Well, it's a fair question. I think that the Department of Transportation, to date, as you know, has sort of said, we we've been told the tunnel will be built, so we have to keep planning for it. But in light of Elridge saying he doesn't even want it in the upcoming CIP, which is a six-year budget, mm -hmm. uh, it does beg the question: When is the time to sort of get real and realize that? Yeah, for the long time here, we're just going to have the surface trail and let's stop pretending that something else is going to get built. You know, building on Irene, can, can we segue into that, uh, the tunnel discussion? And, and sure, if you want to raise what, it now. Yeah, no, I just consider. I think it might be worth dusting off some of the old memos and letters from a couple of years ago that we um, used in this go around with uh, the county executive not wanting to fund the tunnel along the purple line, then getting pushed back and, and uh, getting that funded by the county council. So um, we're gonna have to do it again, I think, sort of get back into that that rhythm of, of um, now asking for them to, to reinsert in, in, I guess, in a supplemental funding of some sort to get the county council to override or to change the budget request. So we have, we have we have the the muscle memory of that, and I think we're probably it's probably going to be even in addition to what you're suggesting, Irene. We're going to have to get the other council members on board, and there are all these new members on board, right? And new members in the council now, uh, seven, six, seven new members in the county council. So we're going to have to do a lot of education as well as to why that expenditure should go forward. But do we want to push for it? I mean, I understand that. You know, we've all seen the improvements on the the across Wisconsin and into Bethesda with respect to dedicated bike lanes. It's safe. It's it's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, once the, the the CCST running through Elm Street, you know that too. I'm sure will be as as high quality. Do we, as a council, want to consider? I'm sorry. Continue to push for a tunnel. I I think that. <laughs> If, if this is just me talking that that I'd rather push to take a portion of what would have been put in for the tunnel and bury these lines along 47th. It'd save a lot more money. You'd still have more room. It'd be safer. Um, and kind, kind of this tunnel's not going to happen. Well, well, the tunnel could happen if the and the funding is it, there. There are funds available. There are funds. It's. It, I, I mean, I think what 
the executive is doing is is the the technical term is Washington monumenting, which is essentially moving money towards one need, expecting that there will be pushback to add money for the tunnel. But it's a great question, right? I mean, we should have potentially another discussion. I think we, I think we should have a discussion because I, yeah, I, the, I, the cost has increased. Yeah. I, I think several things have changed. The cost increase has gone from what once was $30 million to $85 million. 65, 85. Yeah. yeah. So this is a massive increase. Yeah. Um, and um, speaking just very personally, Blunt, I, I, uh, first things first, I want those parks. And I, I, I think our message needs to be really focused and make sure because there probably will be cost overruns for those parks. We probably will need some more money. And, and I just think if more money is needed, we should just be focused on making sure those parks get funded. Uh, well, so I'm concerned about dilution of our message too. At, at this stage, we're on the record in support of the tunnel. So True. if if we're right. going to make a change, it has to be a change to reverse that. Right, right, right. But I think that is something we ought to have a discussion about at another okay. council meeting. Rich, is there anything or Joy you want to add to this? I did. I I do want to. When we sent the memo in support of the tunnel, we had not yet received the final drawings from the transit partners about what the tunnel under the uh, the subway tunnel was going to look like and there was always in doubt whether there was going to be a pedestrian access and it it as it is right now there is pedestrian access from the capitol crescent trail through the tunnel through the metro uh, purple line, purple tunnel, line yeah. tunnel there so that 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 path the the capitol crescent trail path for it's essentially would be for bikers correct Correct. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of everybody, what we're talking about is a, is a tunnel that would go underneath, um, cut through that very small pocket park for a moment, but be, and go underneath the building, large building there, then underneath Wisconsin, go underneath the first block of Elm Street and pop up inside of the park. That's the tunnel we're talking about. Long planned, long contemplated as a underground way for the for the Capitol Crescent Trail to proceed along with the surface trail. But this is what has now become a very expensive proposition. So, um, okay, uh, moving on to Zimmerman Park improvements. Oh, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Dave, tell us what's happening. What has happened with Zimmerman? Um, I guess when last we spoke, uh, we had you uh, put your yeah, pull up. The, yeah. yeah, I guess we had done additional infiltration testing as requested by the county. Uh, we got the results of that infiltration testing back and they were mediocre. Um, so the county requested that we make a few modifications to the landscape infiltration system that was proposed. Uh, so it had to be enlarged slightly. Um, we've resubmitted those to the county uh, for preliminary stormwater concept approval. Uh, which we have not yet gotten, um, but our engineer expects that we'll probably get it in the next few days. You know, we addressed all of the comments that they gave us, so there's no reason it shouldn't be approved. Um, beyond that, uh, Tolbert and I met with uh, the landscape architect that works with the engineer to identify new planting beds and locations for, for improvements to the plantings. And I know that entryway monument at the corner um, is going to be demolished and, and be replanted. So, I'm sorry. The what's going to be demolished? Uh, the area where the entryway sign is, um, because of the alignment of the sidewalk and the need to create a drainage swale right. that connects through that curb, um, we'll have to replant that area. Um, and there's landscape infiltration devices that will need plantings. Um, we're proposing to replant the existing rain garden with new plants. Um, and so the landscape architect is working to put those planting plans together while simultaneously the engineer is, you know, finalizing, I guess, the plans for all of the hardscape as far as the materials, the construction drawings, um, and then the furnishings that are going to be proposed. Um, and so we are planning to meet with him probably at the end of next week to sort of get a comprehensive package that will provide feedback to, and then they're hoping to get us sort of final plans at the, during the first week of February uh, that will 
share with the council just to get your blessing before we send it out for for procurement and bidding for installation like I said, hopefully later this spring if we on that schedule if we get plans and we review them in our february meeting yep. then you would go out to bid at that point yeah we we should be able to ride an existing contract that either the parks department has or the county has um and with one of the contractors that does work is dnf construction who has done all of the town's concrete work um so we're hoping that they'll be able to to ride the county contract and have them you know agree to do the work under those contract specifications and in that case when would the work start um i guess depends a lot on their availability um you know they're busy and running crews um but you know usually for something like that you know if they have three or four weeks lead time they can find somebody that can can work on it so i'm sorry so when, when do you think the work could actually begin um optimistically april probably realistically probably may okay and take three or four months to to do or what what's the schedule do you think probably yeah probably four or five i would four or say five months yeah. okay so late fall we might be able to have it yeah i would think that probably the construction would happen sort of over the summer and then you know we'd be able to put the new trees in get the turf established in the fall once right. the temperatures okay. drop a little bit Sounds good. Any any questions that anyone has on schedule? Uh, I would just recommend that when we get the plans, uh, that we ought to have um, either through the forecast or town crier put those plans out there again and just rerun the commercial and what's going on and what's. <laughs> I just think it's, it's it's already been quite a while. It'll be even a longer time frame before yeah. uh, before it's out. That, but I think before construction starts, we want to remind everybody. Sure. Yeah. What's it all? What it what it is all about, and and uh, make sure no one's surprised when they suddenly see that. Yeah, and there's going to have to be some outreach to the residents that live there, so they know. What well, not just who live, yeah, yeah, certainly who live there, but yeah. just generally the town should be brought back up to speed on sure what's envisioned there and where we are in it. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Can Thank you? you. Great. Good. I guess uh, not on the agenda, uh, but Todd asked me to I guess give an update on Coakland Run. Yes. Um, so I guess we've shared the plans with all of the. Uh, Jason homeowners um, that own the parcels where the work will be done. Uh, they're all on board. Uh, we've drafted a construction and maintenance easement um, that they've sort of agreed to in principle. And we've also filed um, yesterday uh, the joint permit application with Maryland Department of the Environment and federal, um, a federal agency uh, that reviews it since it's in a floodplain and does involve you know, realigning the creek. Um, so that joint permit application, once those reviewing agencies receive it, it starts a 45 day clock for them to review it and get comments back to the town. Um, so we're sort of started that window. And then depending on what comments they have, which shouldn't be extensive because it's such a small project in their world, um, you know, we'll get the approvals, um, we'll get the maintenance agreements and easements executed and then you know we'll take that out for bid or again ride a county or parks contract to do that work um, so we're hoping to get that done probably you know sort of in the same time window as the zimmerman park project possibly a little bit later uh, but it should be done this calendar year certainly great good and we're using arpa money for that so correct good all right thank you sure Okay, um, the Rosemary Garden proposal. Uh, Joy, can we turn it over to you to talk to Certainly. us about this? Certainly, yeah, I'm uh, very pleased to talk with uh, with my colleagues about um, a proposal that came from the Climate and Environment Committee um, to uh, upgrade the, what is now called Rosemary Triangle, um, add some new plants and possibly uh, some amenities um in that space um to make it a uh, more inviting and, and contemplative space um the climate and environment committee has been talking about this for quite a while um i'm going to turn the floor over to sheila blum who has been leading a working group um, within the committee on um, improvements to the garden and then i'm going to ask um, town staff 
uh, to comment on the um, on the proposal. You all have received a copy of the proposal, so we don't need to read through it line by line. Um, so uh, let me ask Sheila Blum to come to the podium um, to discuss the uh, the proposal that the committee has uh, submitted to the council. Okay, Sheila, please. On behalf of the town's climate and environment committee, I want to thank the town council for considering our proposal for renovation of Rosemary Triangle and creation of what we like to call Rosemary Garden. I'll just mention a few of the motivations for this project, assuming you have had a chance to look at the concept paper. We have a wonderful town, as we all know, but we have very few parks and public spaces and won't have more for a number of years. Uh, and uh, one could say that one of those spaces, Rosemary Triangle, has not reached its full potential. So our committee proposes that the town take this opportunity to enhance this third of an acre space on the southeast side of town, heighten its natural beauty, make it more inviting, and enable residents to socialize beyond the perimeter sidewalk around the triangle. Placement of one or more benches and some outdoor art could facilitate increased enjoyment of a rosemary garden, what we like to call rosemary garden. At the same time, the town can reflect its environmental goals in the renovation by removing invasive plants of which there are many on the plot and creating an attractive landscape redesign for the park, utilizing native grasses, perennials and shrubs, which have many benefits. For one thing, native grasses could help mitigate runoff issues in that area, which have been reported by neighbors. The committee also envisions involving town residents, town children, and possibly Chevy Chase Elementary School students in appropriate ways in the project. And another major goal is increasing awareness about native plants and environmentally friendly landscaping while creating a model sustainable community garden. An important note that we want you to, the council to know is that in October, Joy White, and several committee members met with a number of town residents who live near the Triangle to tell them about our vision and to hear their thoughts and concerns. Primary concerns expressed were retention of the perimeter sidewalk and the, retaining the trees on the site. We listened carefully to that and other feedback and most of it was reflected in the final concept paper. In addition, the committee investigated whether there were any ADA requirements or recommendations that we should take into account for this project. And we also considered thoughts and ideas provided by Thornton Matheson, who created a detailed plan for renovation of the triangle a few years ago, and ideas by Backyard Bounty, who a member of our committee spoke with recently. So the Climate and Environment Committee now asks the Town Council to approve its proposal and to have an RFP issued by the town staff to interested and appropriate landscape design firms. And we will have a much better idea of what a renovated and enhanced Rosemary Garden could look like when responses to such an RFP are received. But it's the hope and expectation of the Climate and Environment Committee that in the end, the result will be a beautiful and usable space that all in our town can appreciate and enjoy. And in closing, speaking of joy, the enjoy part of enjoy, we would like to express our great appreciation to our excellent town council liaison, Joy White, and also to our departing committee chair, Dan Clahosi, who is moving to DC, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and Christina and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Thanks, Sheila. Do you want Dave to speak first? Uh, Joy, do, do you um, want Dave to follow up, or should we open it up to questions? Um, I would actually like uh, like Dave to talk about um, what 
So Sheila mentioned that um, they did get some feedback from neighbors um, and incorporated some of the ideas that Thornton Matheson had developed a few years ago. But I would like to um, have Dave speak to um, any feedback that staff had on the proposal. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess Tolbert, Todd, and I reviewed the proposal. Um, I think there's certainly a project there, you know, if the town feels like it's something that you want to proceed with. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we can draft an RFP based on the proposal without getting a little bit more preliminary information first. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I would recommend if the council decides they want to take it to the next step, uh, probably hiring a surveyor to come out and do a boundary survey of the property. Um, that would include, I guess, the topography, a tree inventory, uh, utility yeah. locations. Um, <laughs> I'd like to think we've learned something from our experience with uh, Zimmerman that we better make sure we know where those utilities and are. And then once we get that, Indeed. Um, you know, staff or staff in consultation with the council or staff in consultation with the committee um, can look at it, you know, that'll identify accessibility issues, um, possible need for some grading changes um, because the grades there are really unfriendly, which is probably why it's largely unutilized at this time. Right. Um, unfortunately, grade changes might result in the removal of, you know, some of the non-specimen trees, but, you know, then there's sort of a trade-off there that needs to be evaluated before you can actually decide this is what this park project is gonna look like. Um, so that's where, we would recommend, you know, if the council decides to proceed, you know, have a surveyor come out and, you know, get an engineer to take a look at it and sort of give us three or four concepts of ideas that are possible that, that can then be fleshed out further to, you know, really pin down a fine planting plan with native plants and the sculptures and the benches that are, are desired. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, uh, uh, Dave, a technical question on that? Yeah. Is there a function or, or it, what what function does the triangle play right now in terms of environmental like role? Does it is it a sponge for water runoff? I mean, is there like just beyond beyond and, and by the way, thank you for doing this and I, I love it and I think it's great. Just want to get a better feel for like what's the purpose or the use of the that space right now beyond the the human use. Yeah, I mean it's sort of I mean, it's a stormwater island, you know, it's because the center of it's depressed, um, you know, you probably get a little bit of water that falls onto the sidewalks that will run off to the streets, but any water that lands in the middle of it, you know, stays within the boundaries of the park. Um, there is a storm drain inlet there um, that, you know, at the low spot that everything sort of drains to and it conveys that water into the public storm drain system. Um, and, you know, there's, a fair amount of infiltration, but any overflow does go there. So there could be a chance to disconnect that storm drain inlet, you know, probably design it so there's more infiltration, um, but it doesn't doesn't really take water from offsite and it doesn't also discharge water off the park. Great. Thanks. Sure. Sure, please. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the, uh, the question was whether it's possible to, I guess, raise the elevation of the storm drain inlet and fill the park um, to make it flatter and more usable. And the answer to that is it's possible but it would require the removal of all the trees. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can't fill around the trees there without causing them to, to die. Right, right. So. Um, qu questions at this point? Well, I, I, I like the idea of improving it. I walk by there almost every day and it's in the springtime, it's lovely, even though those plantings are, are non-native some of them are still beautiful um and i was wondering can we is there a way for us to kind of segregate uh, uh elements of the plan so we can get 
first get an idea of what it would cost to, uh, well, first of all, get all the preliminary stuff done to make sure you can do anything. And then uh, talk about uh, what it would cost and what it would look like with just changing out the vegetation. Then a next phase would be, you know, adding improvements of whatever. Is is that contemplated? Would is that what you're asking? Would be asking the conceptual design person to do? Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, if it's a matter of you know installing a bench and replacing the existing plantings with native plantings, you know, we could do we could find a place to put a bench probably next to the existing sidewalk, and we could you know replace the planting beds. Um, you know, without any real study at all, we could just have our landscape contractor, you know, we could work with somebody yeah. to put a plan together and, and have that done. Um, you know, it's when you're sort of activating the inside of the park and you're talking about adding sculptures and trails and pathways and making drainage improvements, you know, you can spend as little or as much money as you want putting those improvements in. Well, I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking is that before we go, I mean, I, I'd like to see segments, not you know, we're going to build this out to look like this. Yeah, I w I'd like to see some some elements defined. What the cost of that would be, what yeah. the additional elements would be, and how much they would cost, and you know, a complete renovation with yes. all the bells and whistles and sculptures and everything, and what that would cost. So. Yeah. So once you have a base map of what the current conditions are, um, I mean, you can take that and you know develop an RFP develop an RFP based on budget numbers and goals right. and the, you know where those two things sort of intersect you can come up with a project and, and send it out all right uh, so yeah. yeah so so thank you again for for putting this together so um i had just a, a few general questions before i go into my specific questions so there were a lot of lessons learned from um implementing denison garden and what I, I wanted to get a better understanding, and I also saw Thornton's design back in the day. Um, is your vision to implement Thornton's design? So what is your vision as a committee? Like what, what so let's pretend it's a, a year from now and it's your perfect space. What does that, I couldn't understand what that perfect space was for you, for you all. Can you talk to that? Could you go to the microphone, please? Thank you, Sheila. It would be a space that would be more accessible, accessible. than it is now. Uh, it would be more used than it is now. And it would be more beautiful than it is now. And I appreciate that some neighbors or people uh, feel that they enjoy the current plants that are there in springtime, blooming time, but I think we can even enhance that, make it even more beautiful. Um, get, as I said, get rid of invasives and kind of, and um, make the environment more of a priority, which it really needs to be. And um, we might even, I, we could have, Thornton has put in a lot of thought into this, but I, I see the um, an RFP being open to other interested and qualified people. Maybe Thornton would want to submit a proposal or not. Well, Thornton's design was a very active park. So that was my next question. Are you, you say more that it's like more accessible, more used. Is it an active or a more passive environment? Good question. I think um, neighbors kind of indicated and the committee felt in terms of active, no, we felt it should be a quieter, more relaxing, more contemplative space for neighbors, primarily adults, to uh, socialize with each other, perhaps sit on a bench and talk and chat and look at a beautiful um, look at the nature around them. Um, and, and the neighbors, when we talked to them and said, well, what would you think about some kind of um, some uh, amenities for children. There was strong um, dissent. There was strong op opposition to that such mm -hmm. a thing. And anyway, we had, the committee had always thought, well, the Rosemary, uh, the um, elementary school 
playground is very close by. Right. right. So uh, perhaps right. that takes care of that. And it's not a very large space. And some of the spaces are not as usable as others because of the grading. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned that you wanted it to be a model of, of, a, of a sustainable garden. So were you thinking a line uh, that would be aligned with the other side of the town with Denison Garden, or would it have a different model of sustainability? I'm going to let Christina. OK. Uh, I mean, I think we would look to RFPs for some ideas. Frankly, though, as a as a resident of the town, I'm not I'm not it's not been conveyed clearly to me how Denison is a sustainable garden. Hmm. Okay, um, so I do think education and outreach is important. And okay. we, we do envision if there's no objection to perhaps some um, a sitting area for students. I mean, sustainability would be in terms of the plants attracting um, pollinators and yep. and bird life, but I do think that needs to be explained more. I, I don't think that's you know really evident when you walk down to the Denison Garden. Okay, but but we're open. Okay, and then my last question is: so um, a long time ago, Chevy Chase Elementary School, like they're in their in their courtyard area, there was an active effort by certain residents of the town to engage so that there would be, it would be like kind of a learning space, mm -hmm. um, more so for like plants than say sustainability, but it was kind of a learning space and that kind of fell by the wayside and that particular courtyard is not being utilized to it say like it's being used for other purposes, let's just say. So I'll, I'll, although it's, it's, it's mentioned here about engaging with um, the elementary school. I was wondering if anyone on the committee has actually spoken with anyone at the elementary school to see what they're interested in. Okay. Not yet. Okay. I guess we wanted more clarity on how we're moving forward. Okay. That's okay. all my questions. Sure. Go ahead, Joel. Just piggybacking on, on Irene's questions. Just one more question. Uh, any thoughts about dogs? dog park space not dog park space i'm not suggesting it i'm just wondering has Neutral that come question. up in discussions it will yeah it shows up every now and again in our park issues <laughs> i don't think there's space on a third of an acre for a dog park but i would certainly hope we would not say dogs not allowed probably dogs on a leash i know this is there now i, I love I dogs <laughs> I would a dog park somewhere Uh, my, my, what I'd like to understand, first of all, I'm very supportive of doing some more, and I appreciate the work you're undertaking. And glad that you've gone back to Thornton's work and tried to pull together the other people who've thought about that. All that's very good. Um, I will say that, that I like flowers, and even if some flowers are deemed to be invasive, they're pretty. And I hope, I don't, I, I know that you explained to have a very color, colorful uh, garden, and that's great, but I'm, I'm just expressing it doesn't necessarily mean if, if by invasives, it means we take out all the existing plantings, or I hope that's not the case, but you'll, we'll work on that down the road. The main thing I want to understand is as a matter of process, um, what exactly the RFP would be targeted to accomplish? Um, the, the, we, we use RFPs usually here when the design work, let me back up. If we, if we are engaging as we did with Zimmerman, um, we actually went through a couple of landscape architects. We chose a landscape architect through an RFP, but it, but there was no really design content to the selection. It was the person's credentials and their and, and the cost of their their work. And frankly, we didn't make very good choices. We actually ended up with two that didn't turn out very well. Um, and then we finally went to to uh, uh, as our associates, and we now are getting some very good work. Um, but it's I, what I heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Sheila, is that you want an RFP, which is more of an invitation to different landscape architects to show their ideas. And then we would take the, the ideas they present to us as the basis on which we would choose one of them, I guess, to actually execute the work. Have I, have I understood that properly? I think so. Okay. I think All right. And I guess I just want to know if, if we feel that we can 
is that the way that the landscape community would respond? In other words, would they say, would we, would they, would they say, okay, if, we, if we went out for a co competitive process, uh, three or four different landscape architects and said, do some preliminary work, show us what you think you could do here, would we actually get responses back that we could then use? Or would they, would they say, wait a minute, you've got to first choose me and then I'm going to do the work with, with, the, with the design. I'm just trying to get a sense of what we could really expect from the RFP process as you envision it. I haven't been directly involved in such a process before, Barney, but uh, Mr. Mayor, excuse me. You but, can call me Barney, that's sorry. fine. That's a... <laughs> Everyone. But I would imagine if we gave a certain number of parameters and perimeters to them, perhaps the only thing they might say is, what is your budget? Which is something we haven't gotten into specifically yet. Um, but I would imagine that it's a limited space. Uh, and if we we talked about First of all, oh, wait. I think they would come back. I imagine they're coming back with ideas and that we would choose a design, I design a firm that gave the ideas that appealed to us the most and that we thought were the most um, okay. attractive. I, I, I like that. I, I'd love that to be the case. Don't get me wrong. Because I think that would actually give the council and the, and the, and the residents and the committee the greatest opportunity to assess different plans and be pleasantly surprised at some ideas that perhaps nobody else had thought of. That'd be great. But I just want to make sure that if we embark on that process, that the the prospective responders would themselves be willing to do that upfront work as part of their their responsiveness to the RFP. I'm just curious. About Maybe that. we could make some initial inquiry. Well, I was going to say for Denison Garden, um, what what happened the process for that was we we knew the budget because it was as a result of a of a, a bequest that was made to the town and um we had a general idea that we wanted a sustainable garden and we invited um three three landscape architects to do a walkthrough of different um areas around the town one of which was the uh, rosemary triangle and then there were a couple of others but we gave a general, like we're looking for the ability to, in terms of parameters, we're looking for the ability to um, uh, educate people on sustainable, you know, uh, asp aspects of their different issues with with gardens and, and how to do that. What ended up happening was that we we liked the ideas coming from one of the three landscape architects, and then had to enter into a contract with that particular landscape architect who would then go through all of the details. So, so just to, sorry, but just to, so actually the RFP. Work. in other words, they did actually come up with ideas up front as part of the RFP process. Well, it, it, we paid for it is my, is my point is that there was, there was a, just a general set of, of ideas that the committee had and then upon, and then did a kind of a walkthrough with three different uh, landscape architects who gave their you know kind of off the cuff ideas for what how they envisioned the different spaces. Yeah. And on that basis, we on that basis, we entered into a I don't even know what the the, the legal word for it, but like exploratory contract, if you will, that now they were paid by whatever the 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 um, deliverable being these kinds of construction details that then were ultimately put out to an RFP. Oh, well, that sounds fine. All I'm getting at is that the, that the RFP process would cause the, the 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 bidders to actually put some thought into what the content would be, even if it's a very preliminary way before we make the selection. It, there was no, oh, I'm so sorry. oh, so sorry. There was no, like, this is what um, my idea is. It was more in terms of the initial contract. It was, I'm going to work with you so that we can come up with those ideas and details. Is it like a feasibility study? Maybe a tent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wonder work. whether we wouldn't say, to keep to the spirit of what Sheila and the committee are talking about, we wouldn't say, we have three contractors who are on a short list. We're willing to pay each of you X to do come back with some designs, conceptual design, and then we're going to choose the one we like the most. And the X would not be very much money. RFP. It would be very, very preliminary. But at least it would mean that we would have something to make a judgment about 
which architect we thought had the most interesting ideas. Go ahead. I want I I want to understand what Dave was saying. Is that if I were a landscape architect and I didn't know what was under that, oh, so his work comes first. His, yes, oh, his absolutely. absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to leave yeah, that out. Right. So that work comes the, first, the no matter before what. Before anything, yeah, comes, yeah, yeah, that absolutely. comes first. Right. So we get a baseline of what right. we know, what the site is. It, it, it's as is right. configuration. And I think that's all we yes. have to. That's the only guidance you're looking for tonight is to let Dave, Dave do his, do, his thing. Do, do that work, right? But I'm, I'm looking ahead past that point right. to how we'd actually organize an RFP process and get meaningful input from our bidders that we could then rely on, you know, help us in making a selection as to which bidder should really do the full work. And then also from a timeline perspective, thinking about budgets, you know, now, as, as you mentioned, the, the time that we're developing the budget for next fiscal year. So the window if we're going to get to that stage where there's an actual number uh, number provided, this is the right window, but we want to get this uh, sort of clear before, like by April, I was there March at some point. I'm um, also a question, uh, totally off the wall, but is, is this an ARPA project? I was just going to ask that. It could be. Well, you're the ARPA person. <laughs> is this, uh, can we fit this, is this in the an ARPA infrastructure world? improvement? project um right. i think that would depend on um what kind of infrastructure um may be warranted on this space and we won't know until we get that initial uh sort of engineering assessment of the space as it is now um but as a practical matter then, we're able i'm sorry please go ahead Joy. yeah no, yeah so because yeah because potentially so let's just say uh for a moment that you know if there were recognized um stormwater management issues there that could be improved upon um, an expenditure that would make an improvement to treat and um, divert water um, would be coverable under ARPA. Okay, good. And a number of good, good questions uh, that, that were raised and I'll just respond really quickly to a few of them. Um, Barney, you raised very good points about um, what landscape designers might be willing to do during an RFP phase. And uh, I guess if a um, if an RFP doesn't have real specific design requests as more general as we're envisioning or more open-ended uh, waiting for feedback from the architects, there's only there's a limited amount they might be willing to do on their own dime. So if if the town is able to put forth a small amount for uh, the conceptual design phase. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I understand your uh, wish for a colorful garden and your concern that perhaps native plants um, might not provide that. And I don't think that's an issue. I think we Good. can we can prove that that you, you can, can have that. lovely, colorful um, native perennials Good. and other plants. <clears throat> I also and uh, shrubs. And also, I want to differentiate between invasives and non-native plants and native plants. We want to maximize the use of, of native plants in this space as much as possible. But um, sometimes there are um, plant, plants that are not native, but are not invasive and could have a design purpose. And we might want to either retain or utilize a small number of those and not be rigid. In regard to, and about stages, um, I want to mention, I want to say that uh, what's in, the way I see it, what's envisioned as amenities that um, such as benches, one or more benches, or perhaps some outdoor art. I, I, I think when, we, when it's looked at carefully, it's something that could perhaps be done at the same time, although we can cost them separately if that's, in fact, we could, we could request that they be costed separately in, in any response proposals. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say regarding art, we might be able to utilize um, town residents. But on the other hand, I a quick look at um, some websites, for example, Etsy, Googling outdoor art. There's some really nice looking metal outdoor sculptures for just 300 or $300. So we're, wow. I'm not talking about thousands. Sure. thousands. Right. OK, good. Well, thank you all for that work. That's no, great. I, I, Please. I do want, I, in terms of the staff's ability to conduct all this thing. I mean, I, 
one of my concerns is that it, they, their plate's pretty full right now. So is it conceivable within the next three or four months that you would be able to develop the, uh, the initial work? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're gonna send that out probably to Clark Azar to, like I said, have the survey done and sort of give us an overview. Right. Um, and then I guess one of the questions probably for the council and the committee to figure out is, you know, for the Denison Garden, the committee took that design and took, you know, they handed us a completed plan for the park and told us to send it out for bid. Um, so the committee was the liaison with the designer and did all of the review and all of the sort of negotiating back and forth to see what the final product looked like. Um, and so, you know, we're happy to do that and we probably have capacity to do it. It's not like it's a huge project necessarily, um, but I guess we just need to figure out the coordination between the staff, the committee, council review, outreach to residents, um, and that can come later on, but it's something that just needs to be defined. So, okay. so there's a, a plan for it. Let's, let, I think it's a fair question to ask, but let's visit it again after the- Yeah, and I, and I, I uh, think it's something sorry, we can sorry. ask the committee to- Help out. Help out with. Yep. <laughs> Good point. Yep, there, there's, there's Dave, there's Walton, there's Dave, and there's, there's Walton, Walton, right? <laughs> <laughs> so can we- um... Can we get, a, I don't know if it's appropriate for a vote here, but um, can we get um, at least a uh, consensus on the council that, um, that will have staff uh, take the proposal um, to an engineer, Clark Azar, and have them survey the site and let us know what's possible um, within the bounds of, of what's been expressed in the proposal. And then that, I, I think that'll give us a little bit more information um, to know how we would like to proceed with this um, and then start to engage residents in discussions about improvements. I think that's right. Is there, do we have a sense of that consensus? I think so. Yes. I think, I don't think you need more than that, Dave, right? We don't take a form of vote. So that's good. Okay. Christy, Great. if you can come up just so that. <clears throat> Very quick question. Um, Denison Garden has much more heart has hardscape we're not proposing hardscape but what was the budget for denison garden one hundred thousand dollars oh thanks and we, we went over it we went it was like 120 we at the end or something altogether it's, it's nice for example to say that we want gravel it was a disaster when when storms came through right. um it it's you know and, and mulch was all over the place and and it included the 100 and more includes also the maintenance costs so there's so the a, end budget was oh dear we're we're 150 plus and maintenance maintenance uh, I don't know the breakdown exactly for Denison uh, it because out, it's a part of the entire town uh, contract with Hughes but what happened was we had a year's worth of maintenance done by the installation company Backyard Bounty and then they had to um, teach you know, cues about all of these different practices. So at this point, they know and under the um, supervision of Tolbert Feather. Mm -hmm. So they, the company knows about this. So at least that part would not need to be included. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Joy. Thank you very much, thank Sheila you. and Chris. Appreciate it. And then take a next step, please. And, I'll, and, I, and when you do finish with this, we can take up the circle. The circle is one of the largest completely unused pieces of property in the town. And there's, I, there really is an opportunity there to do something. Uh, Joel, do you want to speak to that? No, no, I just want to make an, an add on comment. I, 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 I would love to have somebody look at that circle and, and, and throw an idea out there. If, if it is looked at uh, to make it in a way where the, it, it's accessible by pedestrians that we have walked, you know, walking towards it, walking past something safer around that traffic sure. circle. Thank you. That could be the dog park area, but uh, <laughs> it's also where the idea. bocce courts could go. You know that <laughs> bocce courts could be good. Um, There's so many good things, but yeah, it th had, that would be nice. To it there has, really is. It really is an opportunity there to be explored as well. So I'd be happy, Joy, the Once committee, to it, take that great. on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a little island. She did yeah, a lot of she work. Did, 
exactly yeah. so that would be another place to start with some ideas yeah okay i'd like to move on but thank you all very much that's great uh and turn to over to you uh irene to discuss the traffic yeah, so um, I am going to turn it over to Gautam if you can come on up here. Uh, the the Public Services Committee, um, a subcommittee of it, as well as uh, the rest of us, talked about a slow down and stop campaign. Um, so as we all are emerging, thankfully, from the pandemic, uh, so has the traffic increased. And uh, we'd like to uh, make a proposal for how to uh, to address that. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Beth, also for being here, who's on the PSC. And Rich, of course, chaired it before, and Irene's our, our liaison now. I think that the general idea is as traffic is picked up, um, and it's not just speeding, it's also people slow, you know, not stopping at, at stop signs. Uh, we want to kind of get ahead of this issue. This is not being built off of lots of reports of, of accidents or injuries, um, uh, but but we sort of see what's sort of happening and we still have cut through traffic. Of course, we had done that analysis two, three years ago, but a lot of the issues we're seeing are, are actually residents. It's, it's uh, in fact, a substantial majority. Um, so the idea is to sort of further develop a culture around safety and to try to have this town feel like a village within a big city. We obviously know what's, happening all, all on our borders and how developed that's going to be over the next decade. Uh, and, you know, there'll be other implications around cut through traffic or, or that kind of thing. But what we want to try to build is this, is, is this culture around safety. Um, so this takes a couple of different aspects. One is already in our policy around speed humps or stop signs and, and you know, uh, residents' ability within a block to request those, uh, how they get measured uh, in terms of approval. Uh, the council always has the right to to um, waive requirements and to approve those safety measures. In particular, the flashing stop signs we have found, we only have a few of them. I think we have ordered a, a number more, right? Four or five more. Um, and they're not, you know, particularly uh, expensive, but they seem quite uh, effective. And yeah. so, um, so you know, the, the idea would be some initiatives like that have an expense to it. Others around, you know, putting on the on the town crier and the flyers we get in the mail, putting something around reminders there that obviously is relatively low low cost. Uh, we're hoping to try to have a, a mascot or something catchy, some something that's visual. Um, that gets people to associate that image with, okay, you know, how I need to be sort of driving in, in this town. And um, uh, so what we put together was the proposal that showed some of the initiatives would be driven by the PSE because we know the staff is, is busy, but they would also obviously be quite involved and, and they would execute on some of the things as well. We'd work sort of um, hand in glove with them. So we put some of the ideas here, others will, you know, get developed by the committee, by the PSC over time. But some, you know, I talked about the, the mascot of some sort, and maybe that's developed by one of the students uh, or adults, you know, kids or adults in town, um, the ordering, you know, having additional flashing stop signs. And we'd use this traffic study as a guide around where you know, what makes, or complaints, you know, other data we get from the, you know, police reporting of where we should be putting those stop signs um, or the flashing, you know, the the the, the ones that give you your, your speed. Um, and those we have, uh, you know, like the one right outside here, we have, I think a few of those also on order. Um, the town crier I mentioned, you know, again, the focus, I think one area of focus are the two schools, oneness and CEC and, and the elementary school, because that is, you know, a, a little bit more uh, concern and there has been more data there from the police. So we will sort of focus as two of those two nodal points. Um, and then, you know, the major thoroughfares. And so what we are really seeking is, is if there's kind of feedback, if there are things you'd want to develop uh, for us to develop further or, or shift in direction, uh, and then if if not, and you all are comfortable, then we'd start to 
work as a committee and then with the town office. Yeah, Beth, yeah, I, yeah. Yes, why don't you go to the microphone, please, Beth. Well, I just want to give a bit of history. Uh, when Rich was chair, we, we, because we did the traffic study, we were aware that there are people who write to the, to the council and write to the staff, and they really wanted a safer community. They, so we became aware, you all are aware, Dave is aware, that there are people who want to have a safe community. They want to walk their dog. They want to take walks. They don't want to be an elderly person that almost gets knocked over by a car. So we sort of wanted to go in the direction of a positive campaign to elevate that this wants to be, that we want to have a safe community. So it's a way of responding to the people who are have written to you and then other people who probably want this too, but just haven't ever made their voices heard. So that's why we came up with the mascot and the idea for this is a safe community within an area that's becoming very congested and unsafe. So that was part of the thinking. Okay, thank you. Comments from my colleagues? No, I, I'm, I, I'm all for it. <laughs> We've been, been talking about it for years and we ought to do it. Um, but I do, it does raise another issue that I don't want us to forget about is that all, even our uh, the, the traffic study we did, our, our committee, um, when we thought about how to address those, we need enforcement in this town of our traffic regulations. And um, if you look at those monthly reports from the the, the county police, our, our police officers, we stop a lot of people, but we don't ticket them. And um, I, I just have, a, a, there's a fundamental problem here that, I mean, I'm, I'm all for the public being aware and having us come together as a community, but in, the, in the, those people who ignore that, we've got we've to do some enforcement. And um, it's another topic for another time, but I, I just I want to fully support the idea of getting our own citizens involved and in thinking that we need to have a, a safe community. I think we've talked, Rich, that's a good point. And we've talked about enforcement uh, for that exactly for that reason in the committee. And I think one thing the feedback we've gotten is the police have been for a variety of, you know, cultural policy reasons um, are reluctant to in get into a confrontation. And so, uh, and they also are very reluctant to take, I think at least from the committee, to take any direction uh, around this. And I don't even think they, we can't prescribe. Correct. You know, that, they cannot. Uh, we've, I tried, uh, one of the, the, the recommendations from a year ago was have them ticket, you know, maybe someone gets a warning once or however they track it. And then after that, they get a ticket. Uh, whether speeding, running, going, you know, slow, going through a stop sign. And I think we had pretty strong pushback, right? Well, Todd, there's the impression that they're off duty. That, you know, he talks with the yeah. person in charge and they, they have a demand saying a police relationship with the community. So they have to set yeah. their own guidelines. I want this to be a separate they, discussion. I don't right. I, I, so you know, I, it's going to be, we need to talk about it separately, but. I just want to fully endorse the idea of right. getting our own citizens involved and in, in, in we'll helping us think of a yeah. safe community. Joel? Yeah, no, I, I, I second and third that I think this is great. Thank you. Um, and and I, I think it's really, um, it's, a, it's hitting a, a gap about public messaging that, uh, that, that we need to fill which is communicating publicly a little more aggressively about this, because I, you're right. I mean, my 14 year old, when I drive her to school, she loves to remark about how basically everybody blows through the stop signs in town. She's watching, right? She sees it. She's not talking about me. And, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so that's great. Um, one question I had for you, I know the flashing lights that came up today. I'm not sure if they're going to be deployed anywhere specific, but, as reading this, and we live, you know, on 
corner of Walsh and East and East is a beneficiary of the East Bradley flashing light uh, dynamic. Can we get flashing lights at every major thoroughfare intersection entry point in the town? I mean, is that really like a crazy idea or is that something that you've thought about or any feedback on that? Because that it sparked the idea that I know in, on we East We haven't gotten into budgetary. We, this commit, this campaign is really about getting sort of a sense right. and, and mm -hmm. we haven't tried to put dollars to it. Um, and I think we certainly want to focus on the things that are really inexpensive and, and that are really built around culture. Uh, or maybe there's aspects of trying to improve the police enforcement that you know doesn't cost the, the town anything. Um, things like stop signs or the those are obviously there, there's an expense to that. So, well, also what we were uh, discussing as a committee is updating the policy so that right now, as a um, seg street segment, can uh, petition for speed hump uh, and and the like. Maybe we do the same thing for an LED stop sign or or flashing speed sign, right? So that's another potential discussion point that we can have at a later time to update the policy. But having them at the requested. entry points of the town would make sense. I think we. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly has helped reduce the speed of traffic on east without a right, doubt that, that, that one, coming from yeah. bradley through down that that slope down was a nightmare right uh, now it's it's much better yeah and i think you can see at least half a dozen to a dozen where you know the the one right here at leland uh um you know at, uh, the entry from wisconsin I, mean, I think there are many places you know, or some of the ones that are four that are a little bit more complicated four-way intersections i think you could see it there as well that being said, I, I will ask for the, the council's consideration tonight on, uh, you know, three LED stop signs are already deployed, mm -hmm. two are arriving next week, and, and the staff is going, you know, they already have a running list of, of potential problem areas, and, and we'll select there. I'd like to ask the council for consideration to have four more on order, uh, four more LED stop, uh, stop signs. What do they cost each? 2500 2500 yeah. yes each and then um we do have the radar uh, speed signs as well but just to get a little bit ahead of this in terms of whether or not this policy is updated certainly the town staff will be able to have the resources they need to address we have these to have problems. a formal a formal a vote on the or is that is that a consensus issue dave uh, consensus okay issue. any opposition to spending ten thousand dollars for four more speed signs no no, Joy. No, no, okay. no. I, I actually, but with respect to the, the communications issue, um, I would like to raise, uh, you know, something that I've observed, um, and again, not to beat up on the people who have those electric cars, um, but they're very quiet, um, and so I live, you know, close to the intersection of of Leland and Oak Ridge and have seen on more than one occasion you know one of those big electric cars sort of breeze through one of those stop signs um you know i'm getting older i'm not quite hard of hearing yet but 20 years from now i am not going to be able to hear those electric cars go by so um i think it's um i very wholeheartedly um endorse um you know all the communications that we can do within the town not only around the schools um because we've got people who either have mobility issues or uh, you know other other issues that that are going to affect their ability to hear quieter vehicles um i do like i, I don't know if we can ask for more um police cars stationed at key intersections where there are known to uh, where people are known to bust through stop signs like at Leland and um, uh, I think it's Ridge Ridgewood or sort of that caddy corner there there's often a police car stopped um, just kind of behind there trying to catch people who are running through those stop signs and again this is Leland that has like the most speed bumps anywhere in the town um, so we definitely we can definitely up our game in terms of communicating that we want to have a much safer environment for our children, um, for our older residents, for for all of us. Yeah, 
Good point. I, I certainly support it as well. I think you might have an interesting opportunity for a campaign to choose a mascot. I wonder whether yeah, you could, could, you could almost have a, it would be a project schools. for uh, BCC students, right. art class, you know, yeah, just We're also going to try to sort of see what else, of, you know, what's yeah, really see what's out the there wheel. that would grab um, people. That's right. Yeah. And what one, a few people have said is if you make it too catchy and it's on lawns, then you draw people's attention away from the road to the lawn. So well, I think there are a few different you, aspects. You'll, you'll of work it out, but I, I, it, well, out. I think yeah. you've, you've got strong support from the council to do this. That's great. Hey, Barney. <laughs> no. I just assume a lot of the traffic violations are people outside the community. That's not, that's not the case. The case. The, the, the vast majority, that's the reason why they're citations. Yeah. But uh, this is not a public discussion for all that, but that's that's uh, an issue. Yeah. Okay, I, I really want to move on, folks. Uh, okay. So thank you all very much. Um, Barney, may the last, I interject? last item we have, um, oh, we do need, Todd's telling us we do need a motion on supplemental. So oh, could I okay. have a motion? Uh, motion to uh, for for uh, purchasing four additional LED stop signs. Okay. All in favor? Second. Aye. Oh, Aye. second. I got it. Oh, unanimous consent. Done. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, utility update. Um, Dave, back to you. I had asked Dave to to give an update. You know, enormous amount of work has been done on the town streets following up on all the huge amount of infrastructure work that the water company and Pepco had done, but there's still some remaining amount. And I would just thought it would be a useful time to give an overview to the council on what we expect to have coming up this spring and summer, which should be the end of it, but at least the end of this cycle of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think it, it ever fully ends. I know. Um, and I, I, re I caught myself halfway <laughs> through my statement. <laughs> yeah. So I guess starting with uh, utility work, um, WSSC, uh, hopefully later this year, uh, is gonna be coming in and installing new water mains on Leland Street between Meadow Lane and Connecticut Avenue. Um, the block of Meadow Lane just south of Leland Street and also on Thornapple Street uh, between Meadow and Connecticut. Um, I don't know if you've been across Connecticut, but they've been working over there for a little bit more than a year now um, and have had horrible delays. Uh, based on supply chain issues, getting the pipes um, that they need to do the work. Um, so their current estimate is that they'll be here in the late summer or early fall. Um, that work's probably going to take three or four months. Um, so we'll coordinate with WSSC and make sure the residents have advance warning and know what to expect, you know, before that work starts. Um, so, but I guess going forward for town street improvements this year, um, you know, we are planning to pave the block of Oak Ridge Lane uh, between Thornapple Street and Stanford Street. Um, this is a road where the gas main and water mains were replaced about two years ago. Right. And we haven't been able to pave it because of ongoing house construction, because mm -hmm. um, we knew that <clears throat> if we paved it, the utility connections for those new houses would, would tear up the asphalt. Um, so that street is just about ready to go. Um, we've already done concrete repairs. So... That should be pretty straightforward. Um, there are four streets uh, that connect between Meadow and Connecticut and also on Meadow Lane uh, between Thornapple and Leland Street uh, that have not had their gas mains upgraded. Uh, Washington Gas had told us two years ago when they finished the last phase that we should expect those improvements to be made in 2022 or 2023. Um, as of a week ago, they said they're at least five years out and probably 10 years out from actually coming in to finish that work, um, which means that the roads that we had been holding off making repairs to in anticipation of that work are now probably ripe for, for repairs because they're uh, falling apart a little bit. Um, so. Our plan is uh, this year uh, that we will resurface Aspen Street between Meadow and Connecticut, and then resurface Woodbine Street between Meadow and Connecticut. Um, and then next year, following the WSSC work, um, we'll resurface Thornapple Street, uh, which we had just paved in 2019. Um, so that'll be sort of repaving our new pavement. Um, and then we'll resurface Leland Street 
and then the section of meadow lane that still is outstanding that, that, that section of meadow lane really needs it so yeah. that's good that'll be done yeah. so that'll be done this summer fall uh that'll be done probably in coordination with the WSSC work, oh, so, so when the WSSC the work finishes, summer. it might be the summer of 2024. Yeah, probably what will happen is WSSC will finish up sometime over the winter. Uh, we'll come in next spring, make concrete repairs to sidewalks, curbs, gutters, driveway aprons, and then once that work is done, we'll resurface it. So we're just going to be repaving Oak Ridge to. Uh, between Thornapple and Stamford. So, th so this summer, the summer of 2023. Yes. Regardless of what calendar year it's in, but the, well, it'll all be 2023, but yep. regardless of what fiscal year it's in, um, what, what will be done this summer? Yeah, it should be Oak Ridge, Aspen, and Woodbine. That's it, not Virgilia. Not Virgilia. Um, Virgilia, the pavement's actually not in bad shape. Okay. Um, and so... Oh, that's no work scheduled. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so, that's not so just those three pieces. All right. Yep. And you've already done this, this section on West, right? That's been done. Yeah. Something West else. actually is not scheduled for work, although with the redevelopment of 4,500 Wall Street, um, there might be some drainage improvements that get made there, which might okay. Good. adjust right. some I, of I the curb lines. Provide but... that update for all of us to be aware yep. of. Also, we should be aware that um, we will be spending paying very close attention to the stormwater management plans for Corso. Yep. Right now, almost all the stormwater, their plans seem to call for almost all the water to run off uh, the corner down to Meadow Lane. We don't know whether they will, there is currently a smaller stormwater pipe that runs out to Thornapple, but we ought to at least, we ought, we ought to find out whether they might, at the end of the day, plan to do something more on Thornapple, because obviously that would be a big Yep. Uh, 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 acquiring yep. to tear that street up again. Yep. And I guess just one more thing. Um, I did go around with an engineer um, just to look at possibly making some little slightly more extensive drainage improvements um, on some of these streets that were already scheduled for, for repaving. Um, so we're exploring doing some pretty extensive concrete work on Woodbine um, just to help get water off of the sidewalks and into the curbs. Good. Um, and there's a storm drain there that we might, you know, try to direct some of that water into. And we will probably get sort of a general ballpark price to extend a storm drain line from an existing storm drain on Leland out toward Connecticut Avenue. Um, there's an alley between Leland and Aspen that has some pretty bad drainage issues. And there's a bunch of water that comes off of Connecticut Avenue that's caused some flooding down by Meadow. Um, so if we can think we have we, we have the means to do it right. Yeah, so if we can capture that water at Connecticut, um, we might be able to even direct some of the water that bypasses Woodbine and you know collect it more efficiently when it's torn up and we're repaving it anyway. It's probably a good chance to do it if we decide we want to expend the funds. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Thanks. All right. No other business. We are adjourned. See you next month. <laughs>